Welcome to A Look Ahead. We're delighted you've decided to join us. We study the Sabbath School lessons as prepared by the Seventh-day Adventist Church. And this series, which we are coming to the last lesson today, is on themes in the Gospel of John. This, is, this lesson is entitled Epilogue, Knowing Jesus and His Word. This is lesson number 13 for December 28 of 2024. And if you're like me, you wonder where 2024 went. But um, let's begin with the word of prayer. Our kind and wonderful Father, once again, we consider it an enormous privilege to study your word, to consider all that it says to us and, and the implications of it. Um, sometimes it's easy to miss the implications. Help us to study carefully and enjoy what we hear today as our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. It should be apparent to all of us from the Gospels that the disciples were not prepared for the crucifixion or the resurrection, even though some of them had been walking with him for more than three years. There are three times recorded when Jesus told them what was coming. And I found that quite interesting. I hadn't actually looked up each one of these verses separately together to see how they compare until this lesson. I found them very very interesting, but there you see Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Matthew, Mark, Luke. The most significant ones, the ones that many people know about, are Matthew 16, 21, the first time Jesus spoke to them, and the incredible conclusion in Luke 18, 31 to 34. Uh, let me just, I'm sorry. Um, let me just look at this with you. Jesus took the 12 disciples aside. <clears throat> This is on the journey from Jericho up to Jerusalem, his final trip as a human being. Jesus took the 12 disciples aside and said to them, listen, we are going to Jerusalem where everything the prophets wrote about the Son of Man will come true. He will be handed over to the Gentiles who will mock him, insult him, and spit on him. They will whip him and kill him, but three days later he will rise to life. But the disciples did not understand any of these things. The meaning of the words was hidden from them, and they did not know what Jesus was talking about. Who hid okay. it from them? Yeah, exactly. That's the question. Who hid it from them? Wow. Unfortunately, they were so wrapped up in the idea that Jesus, Jesus was to become the Jewish king, would conquer the Romans and give them power over other nations, that those warnings were not comprehended at the time. Jesus' words, did not fit their thinking or paradigm. How often are we bound up by beliefs that are shared by our peers, associates, but are not supported by scripture? Hmm, wonder how often that happens. Do we have the courage and the fortitude and the determination to be sure that what we believe is supported by scripture? If one is reading in the Gospel of John and she or he comes to the end of John 20, it seems that that would be the logical place to conclude. But there is this extra chapter, John 21. Let's see what that chapter is all about. Some of the disciples had returned to Galilee and had taken up their old trade, fishing. Imagine. This lesson focuses on the third visit Jesus made with the group of his disciples after the resurrection. Okay. Snap question, when were the first two visits with the disciples? When and where? In the upper room. What time? Sunday night. And? Right after the resurrection. Well, Sunday of the resurrection day. Mm-hmm. That was the first one. Okay. And the next one? Next one for the next person. <laughs> one week later, because Thomas wasn't with them yep. at the first one. Remember? Mm-hmm. So one week later, and then this is the third now. Mm. Okay. What uh, was he doing the rest of the time? What was Jesus doing the rest of the time? Well, that's a good question, because in one place, you know, it's, we, we know that Jesus ascended to heaven uh, 40 days after his crucifixion. And then 10, 10 days later was Pentecost. That's the crucifixion or resurrection? Resurrection, yeah. resurrection. And some places it seemed to suggest that Jesus worked with them right through that whole time. But the particular visits that are actually mentioned are about three or four. And that's all. 
So I've struggled with that same question myself. So not only were, did he meet with the majority of the disciples, but there were the two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Okay, those were not... before yeah, the, that, that first visit to the upper room. Right, exactly. Those, of course, were not one, one of the 12 or one of the 11 that were left. Yeah. Well, there, okay, so now we have discussed uh, some of those stories <clears throat> in prior lessons in this quarter. John 21, 1 to 14. Jim, you want to take that on? After this, Jesus appeared once more to his disciples at Lake Tiberias. This That's is another now. name for Galilee, by the way. Go ahead. This <clears throat> is how it happened. Simon Peter, Thomas, excuse me, Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel, the one from Gal Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two other disciples of Jesus were all together. Simon Peter said to the others, I am going fishing. We will, we will come with you, they told him. So they went out, and out, and, and the, out at a boat. But at the night they did not catch a thing. So the sun was rising, Jesus stood at the water's edge, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then he asked them, young men, have you caught anything? Not a thing, they answered. He said to them, throw your nets out on the right side of the boat and you will catch some. So they threw the net out on, and could not pull it back in because they had caught so many fish. The disciples whom Jesus loved, the disciple whom Jesus loved, that is John, said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Peter heard that it was the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he had taken his clothes off and jumped in the water. The other disciples came to shore in the boat, pulling the net full of fish. They were not very far from land, about a hundred meters away. When they slipped, excuse me, where they stepped to shore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and some bread. Then Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish you have caught. Was that Jesus' idea of diet? Okay, well, let's, let's talk about that for a second. <clears throat> What's happening here? Mm -hmm. So Jesus is there preparing some food for, for the disciples who are out fishing. He could have prepared any, anything you can imagine. He could have he made... Could have prepared fruit plates. Yes, he could have, very easily. Mangoes. So, what happened? He prepared what they were used to eating. He had fish sticks. <laughs> he, he prepared for exactly right. He was pre he prepared for them what they were accustomed to eating, and that's he because he didn't want them to go home to their friends and neighbors and say, guess what we had for breakfast? He said he had some more important things to say to them. Okay, go ahead. Simon Peter went aboard and dragged the net ashore, ashore full of fish. Big hundred, fish, hundred, not just ordinary fish. fish. 153 in all, even though there were so many, still the net did not tear. Jesus said to them, come and eat. None of the disciples dared to ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. So Jesus went over, took the bread and gave it to them. He did it, excuse me, he did the same with the fish. Then, this then was the third time Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from death. The American Bible says. Okay. So where did the bread come from? Yeah, where did the fish that Jesus had was yes. fixing for them on shore and the bread come from? Did he make it? Okay, obviously. Well, anybody could speak to the weather and tell it, tell it to calm down. <laughs> it does, and he's already done it before with, with yeah. the loaves of the fishes, so <clears throat> he wasn't dependent upon. Well, the major part of this story comes with the discussion that followed the meal. It seems that Peter did not feel that his love for his Lord was as elevated as his lo Lord's love for him. Think about that for a moment. Here in his answer, Peter was showing humility and teachableness. Um, and I'm sorry, we didn't read John 20. Yeah, we did too, I'm sorry. Uh, here in, this, in his answer, Peter was showing humility and teachableness traits that qualified him to feed my sheep, John 21, 16. This gesture on Christ's part proved that Peter was now restored and entrusted with taking care of Christ's flock of believers. What a change. 
the impulsive and overconfident Peter had finally learned to be humble, distrusting self, and trusting Jesus. We do not know if God intentionally prevented the disciples from catching anything that night, but they certainly did not catch anything. The next morning, as they were pulling into the shore, they noticed a stranger asking them if they had caught anything. When they answered no, the stranger suggested something unusual to them. Cast their net on the shallow side of the boat, closer to the shore where the stranger was standing, as opposed to casting it into the deeper part of the water, which is what they normally always did. Suddenly, they realized that they had caught so many fish that they had a little difficulty pulling the net in. John was immediately reminded their, of their previous experience with Jesus. Let's talk about that, Jennifer. From Luke chapter 5, verses 1 through 11. One day, Jesus was standing on the shore of Lake Gennesaret. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Gennesaret. That's another, I don't know why they have so many names. Galilee, Gennesaret, Tiberias. Okay while the people pushed their way up to him to listen to the word of God. He saw two boats pulled up on the beach. The fishermen had left them and were washing the nets. Jesus, Jesus got into one of the boats, it belonged to Simon, and asked him to push off a little from the shore. Jesus sat in the boat and taught the crowd. When he finished speaking, he said to Simon, push the boat out further to the deep water and you and your partners let down your nets for a catch. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, but I have to laugh. Here's a carpenter telling the fishermen who had been professional fishers all their lives how to fish. Now, of course, he had some advantages that we don't have, but <laughs> go ahead. Master, Simon answered, we worked hard all night long and caught nothing. But if you say so, I will let down the nets. They let them down and caught such a large number of fish that the nets were about to break. So they motioned to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. They came and filled both boats so full of fish that the boats were about to sink. When Simon Peter saw what had happened, he fell on his knees before Jesus and said, Go away from me, Lord. I am a sinful man. He and the others with him were all amazed at the large number of fish they had caught. The same was true of Simon's partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. They pulled the boats up on the beach, left everything, and followed Jesus from the Good News Bible. And so I always raised the question, what happened to all those fish? <laughs> yeah. Well, elsewhere we're told that James and John were working with their father. So did he take all those fish to market? I'll say yes. Okay. Somebody did. What was the purpose of the gospel writers recording these two accounts of the amazing catches of fish? You've all heard this story many times. Now you're supposed to know why it was there. It's well, in. The, the, this time that we just read about was to impress the prospective disciples that Jesus could do just about anything. It was to oh, get them to follow Jesus. Very, very specifically that Jesus would be able to take care of them for the rest of their lives if they did what he asked them to do. Interestingly enough, Jesus was standing on the shore having just come from heaven, already having prepared a fire and cooking fish and bread for them to eat. Was this manna bread? <laughs> you ever thought about that? They brought some of the fish that they had just caught and prepared it as well, and they all ate together. But obviously, Jesus did not get go there just to cook a breakfast for them and eat with them. On the day of Jesus' crucifixion, Peter had denied Jesus three times, and this was after he had said that he would follow his Lord even to death, John 13, 36 to 38. Then came the denials, John 18, 15 to 27. Following their meal, Jesus walked along the shore. Simon Peter followed him. Dwayne, so we have another sequence here. After they had eaten, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these others do? Okay, now notice this doesn't, is not apparent in English, but in Greek, it's the word agape. 
Go ahead. Yes, Lord, he answered, you know that I love you. But he answers by saying, phileo. Okay, go ahead. Jesus said to him, take care of my lambs. A second time, Jesus said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And here we are agape again. Yes, Lord, he answered, you know that I love you. Phileo again. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. A third time, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And this time, Jesus says, phileo. Now, let's talk about that. Well, go ahead. We'll, we'll talk about that in a moment. Peter was sad because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? So There's he said phileo. to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Of course, we have to be honest here. They were not speaking Greek. And these words, agape and phileo, in, are in Greek. So we're obviously, John, in writing this, wasn't attempting to, to represent what the words were actually in Aramaic in Greek. And we have no idea what words he was using in Aramaic. So we're just, that's the best we can do. Dwayne has a few more words there. Yeah, go ahead. Jesus said to him, take care of my sheep. I am telling you the truth. When you were young, you used to get ready and go anywhere you wanted to. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and someone else will bind you and take you where you don't want to go. In saying this, Jesus was indicating the way in which Peter would die and bring glory to God. Then Jesus said to him, follow me. Some note that Jesus used the verb agapao, which means to love, as he was questioning Peter. Now, if you've studied the Bible and you had some exposure to pastors talking about this, you know that this agapao love is a kind of love which means it's, it's principal love. You love because the object of your love needs it, not because it's worth it, that object is worth it in any, any way at all. Phileo means that's the kind of love you would have towards your brother or sister or your parents, or your children or whatever. That's family love or f close friendship love, but not the principal love of Akabao. So that's why there's this question that goes on. Okay? So um, he, Jesus, he questioned Peter, except for the last time, uh, using the phileo, and that Peter always responded with phileo, which means to love, but just as a friend or family member. The implication is that Peter had not achieved the highest kind of love. However, something else was probably intended by Peter. Myra? from the Bible study guide. Actually, Peter's response is focused on humility. With Peter's failure ever before him, it is more likely that he is humbly uses a lower term. Phileo as opposed to agapao, go ahead. Daring not to claim too much for himself. And it was this humility that Jesus affirms and which becomes crucial in restoring Peter's Peter to ministry. No question, humility is one of the greatest qualifications for ministry because the focus then becomes Jesus Christ and not self. Peter's restoration as the role of leader in the early church is one of the strongest evidences that Jesus rose from the dead. It would be hard to explain Peter's prominence if Jesus had not in the presence of other disciples restored in the presence of other disciples restored him to ministry so think about that for a moment mm -hmm. jesus is saying i still have a lot of work for, i want you to do peter and i want you to think about this and i want the others to see that i want you to go on with the work i don't want i don't want them going around for the rest of their lives saying ah peter he wasn't nobody i mean look at how many times he denied the savior and so forth Jesus is restoring Peter now that he is, now that he's humble, become humble. Okay? At times, Jesus was very humble. Can you name a, t a time? He washed yeah. the disciples' feet. Yeah. Yeah. Washed the disciples' feet. He washed the disciples' feet. That's probably the most prominent time. Why is humility so important to us? Why? 
Why well, we're all full of answers today, huh? Well, it shows others that you care about them. Yeah. And who was the first non, the really important non-humble person that you can think about? Lucifer. Lucifer, of course. So humility is sort of the opposite of selfishness, isn't it? Peter, of course, was curious. Since John was following the two of them, Peter asked Jesus, what would happen to John? And so we have an answer to that. John 21, 20 to 24, Peter turned around and saw behind him that other people whom Jesus that loved. Other disciple. That other disciple whom Jesus loved, that is John, the one who had been, who had leaned close to Jesus at the meal and had asked, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he asked Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus answered him, if I want him to live until I come, what is, it, what is that to you? Follow me. So a report spread among the followers of Jesus that his disciple would not die. This disciple would not die. In other words, John wouldn't die. Yeah. But Jesus did not say that he would not die. He said, if I want him to live until I come, what is that to you? He is the disciple who spoke of these things, the one who also wrote them down. And we know that what he said is true. And we know that what he said is true. Good News Bible. Interesting comments about something you just wrote yourself, huh? Bible study guide. Simply put, what Jesus was trying to convey to Peter is that the priority of following him does not depend on what anyone else does or upon what circumstances may arise. Peer pressure may lead us to veer this way or that, but we must be fully committed to Jesus, regardless of people or circumstances. This mindset is desperately needed today when people tend to follow whims of public or public opinion. But as faithful followers, and I might interrupt here a little bit, peer, peer pressure and, and following whims has become much worse than it was in the past because we now get exposed to whims and peer pressure from all over the world. It comes on our televisions every day. More wow. than that, it comes on our cell phones and our yeah. mm -hmm. tweets and yeah. Twitters and social media. All the social okay. media. Okay, but as faithful followers of Jesus, we cannot do that. We must follow him because of our own personal convictions in him as Savior, because our salvation is a matter between us and God. When, God, when Jesus comes again, it will not matter what others think of us. It will only matter what God thinks of us. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> the gospel writers did not record everything that Jesus did or said. Jim? John 21, 25. Now there are many things that Jesus did. If there were all, excuse me, if they were all written down one by one, I suppose the whole world could not hold the books that would have been written. Good News Bible. And my immediate response was, does it look like we will have enough to study in the New Earth <laughs> when the rest of what Jesus said and did is revealed to us? Wow. <laughs> Some people read these scriptures and have believed that John would live until Jesus returned, but that is not what Jesus said. He said that if it was his will, John would live until he returned. <clears throat> Let us review some things which we have talked about previously and consider the contrast in John's gospel between light and darkness. We've talked about this before. And there's a lot of verses there which we don't have time to read. We'll read the summary here. From Ellen White, Jennifer. From uh, The Desire of Ages, never can humanity of itself attain to a knowledge of the divine. It is as high as heaven, what canst thou do? Deeper than hell, what canst thou know? Job 11.8. Only the spirit of adoption can reveal to us the deep things of God, which, quote, eye hath not seen, nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man." Unquote. God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit, 
For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. From 1 Corinthians 2, 9 and 10. Okay. Much in the Gospel of John suggests that only Jesus is capable of adequately explaining to us about God the Father because He, Christ, is the only one who has ever seen the Father. Others contradicted this idea. Jesus had some very striking words to say to some people who didn't agree with him on that point. Dwayne? Jesus said to them, if God... And who's he talking to? In John 8? This is the Sanhedrin. These are the Jewish leaders, the supposedly best scholars in the nation. Okay, go ahead. Jesus said to them, if God really were your <clears throat> father, you would love me because I came from God and now I am here. I did not come on my own authority, but he sent me. Why do you not understand what I say? It is because you cannot bear to listen to my message. You are the children of your father, the devil, and you want to follow your father's desires. How exciting. <laughs> <laughs> from the very beginning, he was a murderer and has never been on the side of truth because there is no truth in him. When he tells a lie, he is only doing what is natural to him because he is a liar and the father of all lies. Wow. So um, would you be comfortable going to a big church gathering and lining up the church leaders and saying those words to them? I remember Maxwell used to say they didn't have to consult the learned doctors or no. the dictionaries or the lexicons to understand the words that fell from the lips of the greatest yeah. teacher who ever lived. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that has played in it. <laughs> How often do we have an idea and then we search the scripture to find verses that we believe support our idea? Why do you think there are so many different religions and so many different ideas about religion, even in our own church? How do we respond to truth that does not seem to agree with our pet ideas? How should we respond to the truth that's spelled out in Scripture? From the Bible study guide. There are some people who are determined to hold on to their mistaken opinions, no matter how much evidence they see to the contrary. They also tend to gather around themselves, only those who agree with them, thus serving to reinforce their own errors. Such was the case of the religious leaders. They were so blinded by their own self-centeredness and prejudice that they hated Jesus with a passion. It is so strange that they claimed to love the Father, yet hated his Son. Jesus exposed this hypocrisy in these words, If God were your Father, you would love me, for I proceeded forth and came from God, nor have I come of myself, but he sent me. Okay, and I would remind you once again that Jesus, in this direct conversation with the religious leaders, he said to them three times, I am God. But it was used, it, it was used in a way in the sentence that at first they sort of didn't realize what he was saying. And finally he said, <clears throat> you people aren't very, aren't very clever, are you? Let me tell you plainly. Before Abraham was, I am. Oh, I see. And so they started grabbing stones so they could stone him. Yeah. <laughs> Just <clears throat> amazing. In John 4, verses 46 to 54, we turn back to the early ministry of Jesus and the second miracle that he performed at Galilee in Cana of Galilee. So this describes another type of follower of Jesus. Let's see what we can learn about that. John 4, then Jesus went back to Cana in Galilee, where he had turned the water into wine. A government official was there whose son was ill in Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus had come from Judea to Galilee, he went to him and asked him to go to Capernaum and heal his son who was about to die. <clears throat> Jesus said to him, none of you will ever believe unless you see miracles and wonders. Okay, but let me interrupt for a second. Now, if you had a son that was seriously ill and you were sure that he was about to die and you knew something about Jesus and you discovered he was 20 miles away, what would you do? You'd get there as fast as you could, wouldn't you? Okay, go ahead. 
Verse 39, Sir, replied the official, come with me before my child dies. Jesus said to him, go, your son will live. Okay, now let's, uh, <clears throat> let's, let's think about this for a moment. Here's a child 20 miles away. He's dying. And Jesus speaks the word only. He doesn't say, here's a handkerchief or here's a bottle of medicines or here's something else, go. No, he just speaks. Now, how many times had they seen something like that happen remotely in their experience? Well, this was very early in their ministry, and I don't think they'd seen it. Not, and not with anybody else. Can you think of any other times when it happened like that? They speak something here, and it accomplishes something over there. Now, we're accustomed to that. We deal with electronics and all kinds of stuff all the time. We step, see stuff coming from the other side of the world. But this, I mean, they were accustomed. If they, if they, this man thought, okay, if Jesus will just come with me and touch my son, I'm sure he can, he can heal him. But Jesus speaks. Just go. He'll be okay. And the guy blinks. I can sure he blinked a half a dozen times and said, what? Okay, go ahead. Continuing in verse 50, the man believed Jesus' words and went. On his way home, his servants met him with the news, your boy is going to live. <laughs> he asked them what time it was when his son got better, and they answered, it was about one o'clock yesterday afternoon when the fever left him. Then the father remembered it was at that very hour that Jesus had told him, your son will live. So he and all his family believed. This was the second miracle that Jesus performed after coming from Judea to Galilee. Now there's an interesting little possibility here. I'm just saying, not saying this is gospel truth, but it's a possibility here. Was Joanna in Luke 8, verse 3, this child's mother, let me just turn you over there. Joanna, whose husband Chusa was an officer in Herod's court, and Susanna, and many other women who used their own resources to help Jesus and his disciples. <laughs> Is it possible that Joanna was this boy's mother? Maybe. Because well, the father was... If this was only the second miracle. Mm -hmm. The government official had to have been fairly familiar. I mean, there hadn't been a lot of miracles happening. No. So. The first miracle that we know about was the water to wine. Yeah. So why would he go to Jesus? I mean. Well, weren't there some other miracles between them that he had done down in Jerusalem and other places? Yeah. Or was this was yeah, this the second one in Cana. In Cana. Yeah. Okay. Okay, now here's a, something from our Bible study guide. This man came to Jesus, the light of the world, but he had made up his mind to believe only if Jesus re, ha, uh, healed his child. Now remember up there it says, the whole family believed after this experience. We could say this man's theology was a theology from below. What do we mean by that? Theology from below sets rules and standards for God and His Word. In other words, if God will do this for me, then I will believe, okay? Human ideas as flawed and limited and as subjective as they are become the final authority on how people interpret the Word of God. What a dangerous trap to fall into. Are we, that from our Bible study guide, are we determined to force the Bible and the writings of Ellen White to conform to our ideas of what they should say? Or are we willing to accept them as they are, they are without imposing any personal or even worldly interpretations? Remember that Jesus stated clearly, where are we? I guess that's yours, Jim. John 7, 17. Whoever is willing to accept <coughs> what God wants us will know whether what I teach comes from God or whether I speak on my own authority. Okay. To hear God's word is more than a passive intake of information. It means also to do God's will. This is the active response to hearing the word. And this hearing and doing of God's word is an expression of love to him. So now we have the next part of that sequence. 
Jennifer? From John 14, verse 23, Jesus answered him, Whoever loves me will obey my teaching. My Father will love him, and my Father and I will come to him and live with him. From the Good News Wow. Bible. That's quite a promise, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So the question becomes, what is the relationship between our love for Jesus and obedience to him? Is obedience valid if it is based on any other criteria other than a profound love of Jesus? So this man came with the idea, okay, Jesus, if you just heal my son, I'll love you. Is that a good basis for coming and getting? Well, I mean, that's, that's a pretty powerful reason, isn't it? This is okay. not someone that had spent his life studying scriptures. Mm-hmm. Well, how, how does that, how is love involved in that kind of decision? Well, I, I can understand a commitment, but... Well, really, the word not love. obedience should be a, a willingness to listen or mm -hmm. listen. That's, uh, this idea of have somebody command you and direct you, that, that's not, not freedom. Yeah. You have to have the capacity to make a choice. You either choose to listen and respond or to respond and reject and suffer the consequences or the rewards. So here's another passage to throw into the mix. John 12. 32. Reading John 12, 31 and 32. Now is the time for this world to be judged. Now the ruler of this world will be overthrown. When who's, the, who's the ruler of this world? Satan thinks he is. Okay. <laughs> Lucifer. When I am lifted up from this earth, I will draw everyone to me. That's what Jesus said. Yes. As we have seen throughout this series, the Gospel of John draws us to Jesus but only if we're willing to know God and to do his will. Throughout John's gospel, people who encounter Jesus either accept the light and grow or reject the light and become blind. Hmm. So as Paul said, faith and sin are opposites. You either go closer and if you exercise faith, you draw closer and closer to God or you reject what you hear from God and you further go further and further away from God towards Satan. Okay, Nicodemus, think of the people that had direct, that we have, you know, sections of scripture in specifically mentioning them. How do they respond? Nicodemus, the woman at the well, the royal official we just mentioned, the man at the pool of Bethesda, the 5,000 fed loaves and fishes, Jesus' brothers, the religious leaders, the man born blind, Think about, we, we already studied him, you know. This guy is supposedly, they thought he was a terrible sinner. That's why he was born blind. And he's out there preaching to the Sanhedrin. <laughs> Mary and Martha, Pilate, all encountered Jesus and made choices about the truth and light he brought. Theology from below begins with human argumentation to determine and examine the existence and nature of God. The human perspective, flawed, fallen, and prejudiced, takes pre precedence over the divine, holy, perfect, and omniscient. Theology from below is guaranteed to lead people astray as it has done in the past and will do in the future. Look, for example, at Revelation 14, 1 to 12. When human wisdom seeks to supersede the divine will, attempt to force false worship upon the world from our Bible study guide. So how often do we have human ideas trying to force themselves on our behavior, even our way of worship? The Bible is full of them. Unfortunately, a lot of it because of mistranslations. Well, and the paradigm uh, that they, of, the, of the readers or the interpreters or the preacher types. Well, you have to be careful because the Bible says that God is the one that's responsible for getting us the words, and that would include translation and everything. Now, as you know, there's difference, there's even things that appear to be contradictory in the Bible, but if we look at the total picture, it's got to be right. 
He used a familiar example of the vine to describe what it means to abide in him. I think that's mine, right? John 15, 1 through 11. I am the real vine, and my father is the gardener. He breaks off every branch of me that does not bear fruit, and he prunes every branch that does bear fruit, so that it will be clean and bear more fruit. You have been made clean already by the teaching I have given you. Remember, you, uh, I'm sorry, remain united to me, and I will remain united to you. A branch cannot bear fruit by itself. It can, be, it can do so only if it remains in the vine. In the same way, you cannot bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, and you are the branches. Those who remain in me, and I in them, will bear much fruit, for you can do nothing without me. Now that's a little harsh, isn't it? Whoever does not remain in me is thrown out like a branch and dries up. Such branches are gathered up and thrown into the fire where they are burnt. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, then you will ask for anything you wish and you shall have it. What a contrast. My Father's glory is shown by your bearing much fruit and in this way you become my disciples. I love you just as the Father loves me. Remain in my love. Um, if you obey my commandments, you will remain in my love, and it, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My joy may be in you. What do you think that means? Any idea? Do you remember Luke, was that 10 or 15? It says there's more rejoicing in heaven over what? One sinner who comes through. One sinner that repents and over 99 just people who need no repentance. So Jesus accomplishes what he came to do and how much does he have to, to rejoice over? An entire universe. Wow. Okay. Uh, who's next? Jim, Bible study guide. The secret is to stay connected to Jesus. He is the Word of God, the breath of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheep, the good shepherd, the resurrection and the life, <coughs> the way, the truth, and the, and the life, and the true vine. Members of the Godhead in their word, the Bible, are like magnets. If not resisted, they will draw us to them from the Bible study guide. Okay, Jesus drew an amazing conclusion to this discussion, which we can read in John 15 further on, a few verses later, and we're going to follow through to what he says. This is absolutely amazing when you put it all together. Go ahead, Jennifer. From John 15, verses 12 to 17. My commandment is this, love one another just as I love you. The greatest love a person can have for his friends is to give his life for them. And you are my friends if you do what I command you. I do not call you servants any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing. Instead, I call you friends because I have told you everything I have heard from my father. Let me interrupt for a second. A lot of people and pastors too, when they, when they read these verses, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Stop. But what does Jesus say in the next verse? I do not call you servants as actually slaves any longer because servants do not know what their master is doing. So the real friends of Jesus are what, what distinguishes them? Okay, go ahead and read. So from verse 16, you did not choose me, I chose you and appointed you to go and bear much fruit, the kind of fruit that endures. And so the Father will give you whatever you ask of him in my name. This then is what I command you, love one another from the Good News Bible. Okay. And we sort of skipped over the last half of verse 15. I call you friends because everything I've learned from I've told you everything I have heard from my father. In other words, friends are people who are informed, mm. who realize what's going on, who understand, etc. That's friendship. Okay. So many people have the idea that Jesus is in heaven, pleading with the angry Father, thinking that otherwise none of us could be saved. 
Some even believe that we must pray to some saint who in turn must appeal either to Mary or some, who can appeal to Jesus or perhaps directly to Jesus, who can then speak to God the Father in order to get him to accept us. Have we ever heard any ideas like that? Mm -hmm. However, Jesus, having described us as branches that must remain connected to the vine, then went on to say that he no longer calls us servants. The Greek word is actually slaves, but rather he calls us friends. Could God actually think of us former sinners as friends? Well, what does he say next? As opposed to slaves. Yeah. Jesus went on further in John 16, 25 and 20, 27. 20. I have used figures of speech to tell you these things. But the I'm time... going to interrupt again. How many figures of speech has Jesus used? We just listed a whole bunch of bread and vines and da da da. Okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. But the time will come when I will not use figures of speech, but will speak to you plainly about the Father. When that day comes, you will ask him in my name, and I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf. Oh, oh, hold on. What? 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 I do not say? That's what it says. Okay, go ahead. Why? I do not say that I will ask him on your behalf, for the Father himself loves you. He loves you because you love me and have believed that I came from God. Okay. Think of all the figures of speech that Jesus used to describe himself and his Father. But then on his last night before his crucifixion, he wanted to speak plainly about the Father. His entire ministry had been focused on teaching us the truth about God, and he wanted to speak clearly and plainly about the Father. These are probably the most important words of his ministry. Through much of the times of the Old Testament, people had been required to take an animal sacrifice and appeal to a priest in order to approach God. But Jesus said that he was about to eliminate that Old Testament sacrificial system by doing what? Tearing apart from top to bottom the curtain in the temple. We can now make our appeals directly to the Father in the name of Jesus without the need to take any sacrificial animal or going to the temple or working through a priest, not even himself. Whoa, whoa, hold on, what, wait. Well, what does the Bible say? Myra? Matthew 27, 51. Then the curtain hanging in the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rocks split apart. Good news. Okay. Now let's talk about that for a moment. The earth shook and the rocks split apart. Who did that? So, I don't think this is a mystery. No. It had to be God himself. And who tore that heavy, heavy curtain in two from top to bottom? Well, God said, Jesus said he was going to do it. So. so the idea was in the past that you came and you offered the lamb and you went through that elaborate process out in the courtyard and then the priest took portions of the lamb or the blood or something like that. He carried it into the holy place so that he could bring it a little bit closer to the Father who was supposed to be in the most holy place, right? And what does Jesus say now? Hold on just a minute. Rip. Mm -hmm. He's saying there's no reason for those, all those ceremonies and everything again. Okay. How many of us are still fearful of what the Father might do to us because of our sins? Could God really be asking us to think of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as friends? To see what Jesus said about that, read the prayer of Jesus to his Father as recorded in John 17. Now, we don't have time to read the whole thing, but I'll pick out a little bit of it. And what he said about the relationships that he wants to see among us. Starting with John 17, verse 9. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those you gave me. Does that mean God doesn't care about the world? No. So what's he saying here? I'm praying specifically for these, for these for, disciples. For these disciples, the ones who have responded to my messages, right? 
Okay, sorry. For, for they belong to you. Verse 10, all I have is yours and all you have is mine and my glory is shown through them. And now I am coming to you. I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. Holy Father, keep them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me so that they may be one just as you and I are one. Okay, how does that work? <clears throat> What kind of relationship is there between the Father and the Son? Close relationship. Okay. Go ahead. Verse 12, while I was with them, I kept them safe by the power of your name, the name you gave me. I protected them and not one of them was lost except the man who was bound to be lost, that is uh, Judas, so that the scripture might come true. And now I am coming to you and I say these things in the world so that they might have my joy in their hearts in all its fullness. I gave them your message and the world hated them because they do not belong to the world just as I do not belong to the world. Okay, I'm gonna interrupt again. The world hated them, why? Because the disciples weren't like the world and Jesus wasn't. Okay, so Jesus had given them a message that made them different, right? Could that happen in our day? Yes. <laughs> Let's hope so. What a revolutionary thought, huh? Okay. Verse 15, I do not ask you to take them out of the world, but I do ask you to keep them safe from the evil one. Just as I do not belong to the world, they do not belong to the world. Dedicate them to yourself by means of the truth. Your word is truth. I sent them into the world just as you sent me into the world. And for their sake, I dedicate myself to you in order that they too may be truly dedicated to you. I pray not only for them, but also for those who believe in me because of their message. Mm -hmm. Who does that include? All the rest of us. Potentially all the rest of us, right? Okay. Verse 21, I pray that they may all be one, Father. May they be in us, just as you are in me and I am in you. In other okay. words, together of the same yeah, thought, so, of the same mind. So at what kind of relationship is that? It's called at one moment. At one moment. At one moment between the members of the Godhead and at one moment between us and them. Isn't that what that says? Right. Okay. And, uh, unfortunately, they made that word into an appeasement yeah. or some ritual that you got to go through to, and, and they distorted the whole meaning of all of that uh -huh. passage there. Continuing with the second half of verse 21, may they be one so that the world will believe that you sent me. I gave them the same glory you gave me so that they may be one just as you and I are one. I in them and you in me so that they may be completely one in order that the world may know that you sent me and that you love them as you love me. Wow. Verse 24, Father, you have given them to me and I want them to be with me where I am so that they may see my glory, the glory you gave me, for you loved me before the world was made. Righteous Father, the world does not know you, but I know you, and these know that you sent me. I made you known to them, and I will continue to do so, in order that the love you have for me may be in them and so that I also may be in them, from the Good News Bible. Okay, that's a lot of words about us and them, and mm -hmm. okay, but there's a very... And that process of what he's talking about there, it was not an event hanging on the cross that did it. No. It was always has been since he began to create intelligent creatures, and it's still going on today. Yeah. The at one -ment. Yes. Dr. A. Graham Maxwell, <clears throat> wrote a fantastic book on this subject entitled Servants or Friends, Another Look at God. If you have not read it, you owe it to yourself to do so. Audio recordings of the book are available for some of the chapters. The book is available online free from the publishers at 
speaking well of God, the, the, the reference there. Okay, Ellen White's comment, the voice of God is speaking to us through the word, and there are many voices that we will hear, but Christ has said we should beware of them who will say, here is Christ or there is Christ. Then how should we know that they have not the truth unless we bring everything to the scriptures? From Adventist Review and Sabbath Herald, April 3 of 1888. Are we prepared to surrender our views and to be evaluated by the Word of God? Are we prepared to draw closer and closer to Jesus through the ministration of the angels and the Holy Spirit? Okay, we're, I'm going to read quickly. The angels, this is from Ellen White again. The angels of God are ever passing from earth to heaven and from heaven to earth. The miracles of Christ for the afflicted and suffering were wrought by the power of God through the ministration of the angels. And it is through Christ, by the ministration of his heavenly messengers, that every blessing comes from God to us. And taking upon himself humanity, our Savior unites <clears throat> his interests with those of the fallen sons and daughters, uh, sons and daughters of Adam, while through the divinity he grasps the throne of God, and this is Christ, and thus Christ is the medium and communication of man with God and God with men. And now that we have come to the end of the Gospel of John, which passages or which stories were most impressive to you? I wish we had time to spend another hour discussing all of that, but. The history of Western civil Christianity is filled with horrific examples of what happens when the Word of God is made subject to the politics and prejudices of humans. What are some of those examples and what lessons can we learn from them today about just how dangerous it is when human perspectives become a dominant filter to interpret the Bible? Now that we have come to the end, that's from our Bible study guide, now that we come to the end of our study of the themes in the Gospel of John, how do you think Jesus felt about the preparedness of his disciples for his departure? Remember how many times Jesus had warned them of what was coming. How do you think you would have responded if you had been there in that last meeting on the Hill of Galilee when Jesus suddenly appeared? Why do you think Peter suggests they go back to fishing? Did God, did they really believe Jesus' words? And that's the question we have for you. Let's pray. Our kind and loving Father, what a privilege it is to study your words with others of like faith, to challenge ourselves in our thinking. Help us to take these words and, and, and apply them to our lives each and every day is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.